introduce yourself. Yeah. Take the mic. So yeah, hello and uh, welcome. So this is a great honor to be here, like the very first Lean Startup Meetup Cologne. And we have uh, in Stuttgart, I'm, I'm actually originally from Aachen, so I'm not from Stuttgart, but I lived there uh, since five years. And also we have the Lean Startup Machine or Lean Startup Meetup over there. And uh, it's, it has been quite a success. And I believe in Cologne will be also a really, really nice meetup and reconnecting the dots, connecting the people um, for this beautiful, uh, yeah, lean startup scene. So I will start off a um, little talk about value proposition design. So as you also know, um, for the lean startup machine, uh, lean startup meetup, I'm sorry, lean startup meetup or lean startup cycle, you always have um, also uh, talks. And I will, I will start today about the value proposition design. It's about designing for the business model canvas. So, shall I introduce myself? So I'm part of this great team. We are founded in Stuttgart a few months ago, the Institute for Business Innovation. And our goal is to educate in this sphere. So we try to help companies to uh, get this kind of like startup spirit, to help them to think like a startup, to act, and to be like a startup. And yeah, we are in the founding and uh, this is me, Daniel Bartel, and uh, Benjamin, he's also here today. And uh, my, my two other co-founders are Dr. Winfried Richter and Adrian Tomer, who is a serial entrepreneur from Stuttgart. So, and of course, my network, but uh, let's get to the good slides. So it's about connecting the dots, right? It's about um, putting all together what a startup needs to do. And um, you probably heard about design thinking. Who knows design thinking? Okay, great. So it's a creative method or a methodology to have ideas, to get inspired, and have ideas on a human-centered approach. Then the second one is the business model canvas. Who knows the business model canvas? Great. And then, of course, we had this running Lean workshop today. Then the execution, this is the hard work, actually. Then we go to Lean Startup. So I will, I will talk about these two parts, uh, parts tonight. And uh, after this, uh, Ash will take over to get into deep dive and get you onto the Lean Startup topic. So I'm actually working for this guy uh, since, since a year. This is uh, Alexander Osterwalder. He uh, is the creator of the Business Model Canvas. And he says that every business model has an expiry date. So meaning that if you have a business model, it's like a yogurt. Yeah? It's like the Mindesthaltbarkeitsdatum. And uh, it will expire soon, right? So every business model. You can see it at Kodak, you can see it at Nokia, you can see the telecom, and for different parts of the model. There's an expiry date, and it's important to always innovate your business model. And especially in these times when, when it's really everything is accelerating, you have to keep up to date. And this is why Lean Startup is actually helping companies to survive better. So, and also, there are companies which never make it to the market. Even these big guys, you probably heard about them, Better Place, they burned a 700 million US dollar and trying to do our exchange system for electric cars and the batteries, but they burned themselves with 700 million US dollar. And we think that with the lean startup methods, with business model generation, and with uh, design thinking, you probably uh, will not have this high burn rate, right? So this is what lean startup is actually about. It's about failing early and often, right? Not embrace failure, but if you do failure, you better fail fast to adjust your, your your way you want to fund your company. Here you know this chart probably, this is the cost of every project and this is the time. And what do we often see, like, like for example, in better, better place, um, every time it's too late when you fail, right? You already burned a lot of cash, a lot of time, a lot of talents. You all waste this time. So Lean Startup is about really failing early and often, prototype, learn with prototyping, building an MVP, we will hear this all later. So um, yeah, be excited about Lean Startup and the whole movement from the US and Europe. So actually, um, for the people who, didn't, who don't know about the Business Model Canvas, I will just give you a little video. There's a video about uh, the Business Model Canvas, and just enjoy it for a moment. And um, yeah, here we go. This is the Business Model Canvas. It's just what Beth and Carl will need to craft a powerful business model, and it can do the same for you. Let's dive in and see how it works. There are nine essential building blocks that make up any business model. When you get all nine blocks working together, you'll have answered the fundamental questions any business model must solve. 
We'll start here with customer segments. These are all the people or organizations for which you're creating value. For each segment, you have a specific value proposition. These are the bundles of products and services that create value for your customers. Channels describe through which touch points you're interacting with customers and delivering value. The customer relationships outline the types of relationships you're establishing with your customers and how you're acquiring and retaining them. Pricing mechanisms through which your business model captures value are documented under revenue streams. The key resources show which assets are indispensable in your business model, so you can describe the infrastructure you need to create, deliver, and capture value. The key activities show which things you need to be able to perform well. The key partners show who can help you leverage your business model, since you won't own all key resources yourself, nor will you perform all key activities. Once you understand your business model's infrastructure, you'll also have an idea of its cost structure. Any business model can be mapped this way. Nine building blocks working to reinforce and strengthen each other. But before you make a model for yourself, it helps to see what a breakthrough business model looks like in action. Like this one. Low-cost airlines revolutionized air travel thanks to their disruptive business model. Let's first look at their value proposition. A low-cost airline offers ultra-cheap flights to their main customer segment, budget travelers, by adopting a no-frills policy. And this leads to additional revenue streams, because customers pay for their ticket and additional fees on items like food and drink, priority boarding, and luggage. The airlines save even more money through their choice of channels, selling only through call centers and the internet, making for efficient, if not always convenient, customer relationships that are automated and often impersonal. Okay, that covers the right side of the canvas, the part everyone can see. The left side of the canvas is what's going on backstage. Like their choice of key resources, they reduce maintenance and training costs by using a single aircraft model for the whole fleet, and they only fly to cheap airports where it's cost efficient to land or where they even get paid to touch down. Planes that do land have quick turnarounds, so they get back in the air earning money as quickly as possible. And they form key partnerships with others in the travel industry, like car rental, hotel and insurance companies. Finally, under cost structures, all maintenance, training, airport and call center costs are trimmed to their lowest levels. All of these pieces working together make their fares almost impossible for traditional airlines to compete with. There's nothing superior about these airlines except their business models. They're reaching an entirely new segment of travelers, out of reach for traditional airlines. Mm. Cutting out costs is pretty exciting, right? But wait! Mm. Just because it's successful for discount airlines doesn't mean it will work for your idea. Luckily, the business model canvas allows you to iterate many models and test them quickly. Let's get started with your own business idea. So, as half of you probably know this business model canvas, so these are the nine building blocks you use to build a business. So actually, it's an agile method which uh, will replace the uh, business plan uh, for a lot of startups. So a lot of startups are working with this tool actually. There are some, uh, some, some uh, iterations about this model already, like for example the Lean Startup Canvas, or the Lean Canvas, you probably know from Ash, Mavara, and the Lean Team Canvas from, uh, from you, Ben. But uh, so there are a lot of uh, different ways to use it. But what do you think? Why people or why startups are more and more using the business model canvas instead of a business plan? What is the advantage of this tool? It's much more flexible, yeah. What else do you think? Absolutely. Yeah, so actually you can use these studies or like any post-its, put it on the wall and like iterate your business plan, change the way you go, and if it doesn't work, just dismiss it, throw it away, and then you can keep on and doing a different business idea. So it's much easier than writing a painful 30 pages plus business plan, right? So I think the first steps when you do a business, create a new one, you, might, you may use this tool uh, to, yeah, to create your business. It's actually, and it's a language. It's a language you can use, so everybody understands the business model in minutes. So when I show you a business model, you, you probably now figured out. Anybody else? Okay, so what you also can, um, what's also important is the value proposition and the custom segment. Actually, this is the most important. And this is what you also hear in Lean Startup. It's about a product and a problem and a solution and a customer segment. 
And this is where the value proposition uh, designer or the value proposition design or the value proposition canvas kicks in. It's about really fitting these two sides together. And there's another tool you can use. It's a value proposition design. And uh, this is what we're going to talk about in, in a minute. So a value proposition, is, it's not about your idea or your solution. It's actually about solving a real problem or customer need or wish. So uh, do you have any examples for problems? What, are, what could be problems? Need to, uh, problems of customers. For example, yeah? Time, OK. No time, don't have any time. OK. So what are, what are, what are needs or wishes? You may want to attack, uh, attack with your attack with your customer with your startup. What kind of uh, wishes or needs need to be fulfilled? For example, entertainment, right? So when somebody gets bored, he wants to get entertained. It's kind of like a need. So we can actually build on this, right? So for the value proposition, it's important to figure that out. And this is where the value proposition and customer segments meet meet each other. And therefore, we're talking about the value proposition and the customer and they have to meet each other. And in the end, it's a fit. It's a fit between these two. So whenever a business model you have, you need to make sure there's a fit between these parts, the customer segment and the value proposition. If it does not match, you will fail, because nobody will pay for it. Right? So how, let's zoom in. Let's see what's behind these, these two points about the customer segment. So on the first side, we have the customer jobs. These are the jobs to be done. You probably heard about this as well. We're going to see a little movie soon. So it's about the customer jobs. What is the job of a customer? What needs to get done? And I will show you a little video about this. This is the last video. But um, yeah, let's see what is the job, and especially a job from, of a milkshake. So let's see what's the job of a milkshake. Hi, my name is Clay Christensen. I'm a professor at the Harvard Business School. I brought with me a set of puzzles, all related to innovation. We decided that the way we teach marketing is at the core of what makes motivation difficult to achieve. The most helpful way we've thought of it so far is that we actually hire products to do things for us. And understanding what job we have to do in our lives for which we would hire a product is really the key to cracking this problem of motivating customers to buy what we're offering. So I wanted just to tell you a story about a project we did for one of the big fast food restaurants. They were trying to goose up the sales of their milkshakes. They had just studied this problem up the gazoo. They brought in customers who fit the profile of the quintessential milkshake consumer. They'd give them samples and ask, could you tell us how we can improve our milkshakes so you'd buy more of them? Do you want it chocolatey or cheap or chunky or chewy? Or... They'd get very clear feedback. They would then improve the milkshake on those dimensions, and it had no impact on sales or products whatsoever. So one of our colleagues went in with a different question on his mind, and that was, I wonder what job arises in people's lives that caused them to come to this restaurant to hire a milkshake. So we stood in a restaurant for 18 hours one day and just took very careful data. What time did they buy these milkshakes? What were they wearing? Were they alone? Did they buy other food with it? Did they eat it in the restaurant or drive off with it? It turned out that nearly half of the milkshakes were sold before 8 o'clock in the morning. The people who bought them were always alone. It was the only thing they bought, and they all got in the car and drove off with it. So to figure out what job they were trying to hire it to do, we came back the next day and stood outside the restaurant so we could confront these folks as they left the milkshake in hand. And in language that they could understand, we essentially asked, excuse me, please, but i got to sort this puzzle out. What job were you trying to do for yourself that caused you to come here and hire that milkshake? And they'd struggle to answer, so we'd then help them by asking other questions like, well, think about the last time you were in the same situation, needing to get the same job done, but you didn't come here to hire a milkshake. What did you hire? 
And then as we put all of their answers together, it became clear that they all had the same job to do in the morning. And that is they had a long and boring drive to work. And they just needed something to do while they drove to keep their commute interesting. One hand had to be on the wheel, but somebody had given them another hand, and there wasn't anything in it. And they just needed something to do while they drove. They weren't hungry yet, but they knew they'd be hungry by 10 o'clock. So they also wanted something that would just go down there and stay for their morning. Good question. What do I hire when I do this job? You know, I've never framed the question that way before, but last Friday I hired a banana to do the job. Take my word for it, never hire bananas. They're gone in three minutes, you're hungry by 7.30. If you promise not to tell my wife, I'd probably hire donuts twice a week, but they don't do it well either. They're gone fast, they crumb all over my clothes, they get my fingers gooey. Sometimes I hire bagels, but as you know, they're so dry and tasteless. Then I have to steer the car with my knees while I'm putting jam on them, and then if the phone rings, we've got a crisis. I remember I hired a Snickers bar once, but oh, I felt so guilty I've never hired Snickers again. Um, let me tell you, when I come here and hire this milkshake, it is so viscous that it easily takes me 20 minutes to suck it up that thin little straw. Who cares what the ingredients are? I don't. All I know is I'm full all morning and it fits right here in my cup holder. Well, it turns out that the milkshake does the job better than any of the comp competitors which in the customers' minds are not Burger King milkshakes, but it's bananas, donuts, bagels, Snickers bars, coffee, and so on. But I hope you can see how, if you understand the job, how to improve the product becomes just obvious. Great. So, so you, you probably saw in this short movie about uh, the job to be done, and you see it's a way different approach than it has been used before, right? Before that, you were saying, okay, about products, the milkshake, and maybe make it more juicy, make it more, more, more tasty, make it in different, different kind of tastes. But then, you know, suddenly, if, if, you, if you change your perspective, and this is design thinking, actually, if you change the perspective of your product, taking it to a job, it's much more uh, different and much more difficult to find out. And this is actually customer development, same Lean Startup, you use for finding out customer jobs and finding out the pains, the pains of the customer. What is the problem? What is actually making the trouble? What he needs to get done and why it's hard to achieve. And then you see also the pay the gains. What is important? What the, cu what the customer wants to gain? What, what job he wants to get done and why? So when, what makes him happy in the end? Right? So these are the gains. And using this customer jobs, pains and gains will much easily, much more describe the customers much more than saying, okay, it's, it's a male, 25 years old, uh, he's driving to a coffee shop every morning. So you see it's a much more different point of view you can use. And on the other side, you have this product, right? So it's a product or service you offer, and uh, what is behind this? So what is actually the product your value proposition will be based on? And then, what are the pain relievers? What is your product, in this case the milkshake, what, is it, what it does to have a pain relief, right? What does this solve for the customer? And in the end, the gang creators, how to make the customer happy in the end? Like, really, like, in the, in the milkshake, you know, it takes for 20 minutes, it's uh, really juicy, it will, it will uh, make a task of, like, having more fun during driving to work, and so on. So these are the gang creators, and this is, the, this is actually the value proposition in the end you want to achieve. So when you build this into your business model canvas, you have... On the, wrong side, on, the, on, the, on the first side, why you're doing this, what is the need for the customers, and having the empathy, right? Getting, gaining empathy. On the other side, you have the value proposition. This is the one you're designing. You're designing with the customer and design on your, on your value proposition canvas. And in the end, you have these two, and this fits into the value proposition canvas you can then use for the business model canvas. I'll come to this a little bit later. So for example, this is the website of a yummy tummy. It's a delicious soup, but nobody knows it's a soup, right? There's no value proposition offered on this website. I mean, it doesn't tell you anything, right, about the product. But if you see, we, we made uh, the value proposition more clearly, is Shopify, for example. Shopify is a great product. Use Shopify to create your online store. Everything you need to start selling online today. You see, you feel the value in there. You see, it's not talking about it's like an online uh, system you can put in products and then selling it online. 
It's about getting really, really fast, or everything you need, and then today. So there's a job to be done, is having an online store, make it, make it easy. And this uh, Shopify is one of the successful products or startups we, we see around having a good value proposition. Same with Unbounce. Unbounce is a website you can build, publish, and A-B test landing pages without IT. So they promise you, without the pain of having a developer in your startup, to do your first A-B split tests. And this is a pain. Finding an IT developer is really a pain for startups. It's, uh, I hate it, and I luckily uh, found some good people. But um, yeah, you could also doing the first A-B test without any knowledge of IT. So this is actually what Unbounce is promising you. This is the value proposition behind it, and also addressing a special customer segment. And this is really important to figure out. So when you're filling out this business model canvas, or the value proposition canvas, and here comes Lean Startup, so, but of course, these are all assumptions, right? They're all assumptions. We, we, may, we may observe this and have empathy, so this, is, this might be r real, but of course, the value proposition and the product we then think out of might be different. So it's actually where we have to get out of the building, and this is where Lean Startup kicks in. Steve Blank's famous quote, I have it even on the shirt. You, can, you cannot buy it anymore, but it's a great shirt. <laughs> get out of the building. There's Steve Blank here on my on my buddy, and he's, uh, he's one of the, uh, well, of the, of the founders of this customer development lean startup approach. So it's about talking to your customers, get off the building, and this is really, really a painful task nobody actually learned in school. And this is why it's really, really important to get trained, get used to these methods, get trained to get out of the building, talk to people, and so on, doing customer interviews, customer development, and so on. We'll hear, we'll hear all about this in, in just a minute from Ash. But in the end, when you come back into your building, you can use whatever tool you, you want. But in this case, you can then just take off the wrong assumptions, arrange your product, and then go and test it with the MVP, the so-called minimum viable product. So this is also a key uh, term to test your customer, the problem, and solution. So is the customer there? Is it the customer we, we're going to address with the right problem? And is this a solution we, we built for him? And does he want to pay for it? So this is really important. And this is, I just give you, you know, I just give you kind of like a really crash course in Lean Startup. So actually, uh, yeah, you should, you should take ten, two days uh, to go to an Ash workshop. So this is the last slide on Lean Startup, I promise. About build, and learn. So it's a scientific approach. Build your minimum viable product. Your, 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 your uh, product or your case, your website, your prototype, which you gain data out of. Then you measure the data, and then you learn from the data and do it all over again, and as fast as you can. This is how startups work today, and this is what lean, running lean, lean startup is about. So in the end, it's about what product or service will make it. Right? The customer, you won't probably change the customer that much, because you found a problem which is viable, but you have this open slot in this, in this slide, and yeah, which kind of product will help you? You will use data analysis, you will use the Lean Startup running Lean methodology to find out what is really the key product. Yeah, and in the end, you have this fit. And as I'm talking about fits, you heard about two terms in Lean Startup, it's really important. One of them is a problem-solution fit, right? I, told, I talked about this earlier. You have a problem, and then you have a solution, and this fits. So it's a problem-solution fit. And if the market accepts it, that's the PM fit, the pro a product market fit, right? So you have a product and a market that will accept your product, and then you will scale. You probably will hit the roof and make a tons of money. This is a dream of all startups, but you know it's not that easy. But don't forget, this is only like one tool. The doing behind is more important. It's also important. So use your business model to design your, way, your, your business, how you make money, actually. This is why you use the business model canvas. You're finding out the value proposition with the value proposition designer or the value proposition canvas. And of course, you use Lean Startup and the customer development approach to test and build your startup. So that's it on my side. Thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed this. And yeah, so now. We can do love. Yeah, of course. Thank you. 
So questions? <laughs>